Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that your Holy Spirit be our teacher today. May the words that come out of my mouth be the words that God wants spoken, and may the words that reach the mind be the words that you want to impress upon the people. Give us your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've all seen pictures like this on the news repeatedly. Uncontrollable fires, total devastation, and floods. Cities, whole cities drowning. And tornadoes, and the havoc the tornadoes wreck. And hurricanes, one after the other after the other. And now the news is war. Ukraine or Hezbollah and Israel, aggression that people feel must be stopped, or we're going to move into a multi-nation war. And the fear is World War III would bring total annihilation. These pictures are all too common. However, have you ever looked up the definition of the word apocalypse? I decided to do that this week, and I went to Oxford Dictionary, and this is what it said. I was amazed what they said. Apocalypse, the complete, final destruction of the world as described in the book of Revelation. However, the dictionary meeting is not, well, the dictionary meeting is really not the accurate biblical meaning. We need to look at It's not a cataclysmic end. Apocalypse is just the Greek for the revelation, the word revelation. We need to understand what is the biblical definition of apocalypse. You see, apocalypse is made up of two parts. The first three letters, A-P-O, that's a preposition in Greek. It means away from, moving away. And calypse, well, you recognize calypse. The eclipse of the sun, it's a covering over the sun, eclipse of the moon, a covering over the moon. Uh, yes, I saw that. It happens today. And so when Revelation says, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, it implies that there is a covering. There is a mystery that Jesus Christ must come to remove, to make clear. You see, the world is a full of a lot of confusion. There are coverings, veils, mysteries, errors in people's thoughts that need to be corrected. The mystery especially, what is God doing? Why is God not doing more? Mysteries. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, came down to this earth to remove the mysteries, to remove the coveries, and to make all things clear. That's the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. I've said many times, probably, that 95% of revelation comes from the Old Testament. And if we understand want to understand Revelation, we need to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament. A lot of Revelation comes out of the New Testament. But Revelation also comes out of Roman culture, Greek, old Greek culture, and even the geography of the world. And another point, when we study, it's a good idea to go to the earliest possible definition in the Bible, because that is probably the most accurate definition of the word. You see, there's an important lesson in this. And the lesson is, God meets people wherever they are. He meets people so as to review, remove the mystery that's in their mind. And Jesus doesn't just come to a class like this. Jesus doesn't just come to church service that the pastor presents. Jesus comes wherever we are at any moment of time, Jesus will be there to help remove that mystery. For example, Adam and Eve, they ate the forbidden fruit and they ran away to hide from God. God came 
to where they were, didn't he? Think of Moses in training to be the next Pharaoh. But he saw a Hebrew and an Egyptian fighting, and he killed the Hebrew. He killed the Egyptian, and he had to flee to the wilderness. Forty years in the wilderness. But God met him in a burning bush, didn't he? God meets us wherever we are. And we could say the same thing for Daniel, the prophet of Daniel, the prophet of Ezekiel, young men who were deported to Babylon, and they were trained in the universities of Babylon. But God met them and made them his prophets. Think of Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest of the kings of Babylon. But he became insane, insane. And God met him in his insanity and brought conversion to him, so much so that Nebuchadnezzar wrote the last half of the fourth chapter of Daniel. God meets people where they are in any moment of time to remove their misconceptions. Apocalypse means removing a covering of a mystery. Sometimes we just don't understand God, and God seeks to make himself clear. The sanctuary is a very good illustration of this. There's a white curtain all around the sanctuary. Outside the curtain, outside beyond the curtain, was sin, apostasy, error, destruction, and death. That was outside the coverings. But inside the covering, if you go way inside the covering, that's where God was, the Shekinah glory. There is only one door into that sanctuary. But if you went through that one door and you were in the courtyard, that was the place of repentance and conversion. You go through the first veil and then you're in the area of reformation and sanctification. And if you go inside another veil, then you come in to the presence of God, the Shekinah glory. All of this was seeking to show that even though there is mystery surrounding God, we can go through that mystery and God will reveal himself. Now, we were talking about the curtain around, but there's also coverings vertically. And on top was a cloud, and under the cloud were four more layers of material, each layer a little brighter, a little more beautiful, until you came to the Shekinah glory in the middle. All of this sanctuary was to show that the curtains, the veils, the coverings above and around God reveal sometimes misunderstood character of God sometimes mysterious activities of God, the sanctuary reveals God in a way that people can see. That's the theory. Let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible says. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud. That's the word we want to talk about. The cloud that is above, the curtains that are around. We're talking about that for a good share of our time this morning. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, leading the way. The cloud reveals in a way that Israel could see that God was there leading them on their journey through life. They came to the Red Sea. At the Red Sea, beyond the Red Sea was the promised land, wasn't it? But the Red Sea was an impossible place to them. And behind them was a murderous army of Egypt. So the cloud, that's what we're studying, the cloud came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, but it gave light by night to the other, so that one could not come near the other all that night. You see, the cloud was two things. 
it was darkness and doom for the Egyptians. But it was the presence of God to Israel and to the deliverance that was to come and the knowledge of God that they were to receive. In Revelation, in Revelation, we will see a cloud, a symbol repeatedly, a symbol of God guiding and giving knowledge. Also, a symbol of Satan and the errors and deceptions that he believe, bring. But the cloud is always God leading his people. While it was a protection to the people, notice this. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the armies of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and what? The cloud. And he troubled the armies of the Egyptians. While the cloud was protection for God's people, it was disaster and doom for the enemies of God. So let's come on in and sit down. Let's go on to Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to who? To you. And will believe who? You see, God came down on Mount Sinai in the cloud so that he could speak to all Israel. But he also wanted Israel to realize that Moses was a spokesperson from God so that the people would l come to believe Moses, the prophet of God. You see, God uses prophets to lead his people. God doesn't often speak audibly to people but he does speak to his prophets in a way that they know and we can study the prophets in the word of God. God was with Abraham when he told him to offer his son. He was with John the Revelator when he wrote the Revelation. And he was with who? God's prophets. Or God's pastors, God's teachers, God's leaders. And God uses prophets to remove evil and to present truth that needed at that moment of time. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to who? His prophets. God shows the past and how we got to where we are. God shows the present and the things that we need to do now, and he also shows the future, what is ahead of us and the potential, present truth he presents. But he also presents errors to correct them, to remove them. God meets people where they are. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thunderings, lightnings, a thick cloud, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now, I understand the lightning. I understand the trumpet. I understand the thunder. God is getting the attention. He uses things to get the attention of people. But what's the cloud have to do with that? There is a, there is a what? It's protected of but also, and I repeat this over and over again, throughout the Bible, God is enveloped in a cloud because much of God's activities are a mystery. When he comes, he uses things like trumpet to get our attention, but then God in his cloud will reveal the mysteries and lead his people. I want to go on in the Old Testament. We're looking at the cloud. This is, I'm, Exodus chapter 40 is about setting up the wilderness tabernacle. When they made all of the furniture and all the curtains and everything, notice what happened 
when it was all set up and it was ready. And Moses was what? Not able to enter the tabernacle of the meeting because of what? The cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When it was all ready, God's glory filled the tabernacle. That's important because it says God is teaching about himself in the tabernacle. But when that happened, not even Moses, the prophet of God, could enter. Not even Moses could behold God. Not even Moses could understand God. If he didn't understand, how much would we understand? But let's go on to Solomon's temple. And almost the exact same thing is said about Solomon's temple. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. You see, the temple, the tabernacle, the temple, all were teaching about the character of God, about the activities of God. But nobody could go right into the presence of God to understand. It was too much. They couldn't comprehend. Now, we saw almost identical pictures in the tabernacle in the wilderness, Solomon's temple here, but there's also a temple in heaven. And notice what it says in heaven. And the temple was what? Filled with smoke from the glory of the Lord and from his power and what? No one could enter. Does this sound like the previous two verses? Do you see how Revelation grows out of the Old Testament? You have the Old Testament setting up the wilderness and they couldn't enter because of the glory of the Lord. Solomon's temple, they couldn't enter because of the glory. And heaven itself, they could not enter. But now, Revelation does one more thing that the Old Testament does, does not do. Revelation adds information to the Old Testament. And I want you to notice what Revelation adds to the previous two experiences. Notice. No one was able to enter until, till when? Seven plagues of the seven angels are completed. The Revelation has the seven churches. And you've got to go past the seven churches. It has the seven seal. You have to go past the seven seal. It has the seven trumpets. You have to go past the seven trumpets. You have to go to the close of probation. And after the close of probation, the seven last plagues. Not until you get to after the seven last plagues. What happens after the seven last plagues? We go to heaven. And can we enter heaven? We cannot enter until when? Until the seven last plagues are over. We will not comprehend God fully until we get to heaven. But the promise is, when we get there, there will no more be no more clouds in heaven. We will be with God and he will explain everything fully to us. I want us to notice the words of Jesus to his disciples. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot what? You can't bear them. Why couldn't the disciples bear them? They had wrong concepts of Jesus, didn't they? Jesus meets us where we are, and he seeks to help us understand God. Now, there are two mysteries in the Bible. Two totally different mysteries, and I want us to see both of them. This one. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of what? Mystery of the kingdom of God. That's one mystery. Paul also talks about this mystery. And without controversy, 
Great is the mystery of what? Godliness. We just don't understand God manifested in the flesh. We don't understand God justified in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up. We don't comprehend all of this. Great is the mystery of godliness. But there is a second ministry. And it is the mystery of lawlessness. The mystery of sin. Revelation also talks about this mystery. And on her forehead was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. The angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman. We have a hard time comprehending God because he is so great. But Satan makes it worse, doesn't he? And he brings in so many lies, so much confusion. He is there to cause us not to comprehend God. That's the mystery of Babylon. That's the mystery of sin. That's the mystery of iniquity. You see, the apocalypse tells us the truth about God and helps us to understand the mystery of his action. But the Bible, Revelation, also talks about the deception of Satan and the mysteries of iniquity. God meets people where they are and tries to help them to understand. But let's go back to Revelation chapter 1. We've been out of Revelation a long time. Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you two questions. One question, and then a little bit later, the second question. Is this revelation of Jesus Christ, is it a spotlight showing down on Bethlehem so we see God come down to human flesh? Is it a spotlight at the Jordan River when Jesus is baptized and the Father says, this is my beloved Son, hear ye him? Is it a spotlight that comes to the trial of Jesus before Caiaphas when Jesus says, you'll see me coming in the clouds of heaven? Is it a spotlight on the cross where we see Jesus dying in our place so we don't have to? Is it a spotlight on the, on the empty tomb after Jesus come out? Is it a spotlight on all of the activities of Jesus or the revelation of Jesus Christ? It is, a mic is it a microphone in his hand when he preaches the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are you when you are persecuted. Is it a microphone in the hand of Jesus when he tells to the woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Is it a microphone in the hand of Jesus when he's on the cross and he says, Father, into thy hand I commit my spirit. I will trust you, Father, even through death. Is it a microphone in the hand of Jesus when he comes out of the tomb and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Is it a spotlight or a microphone? Revelation can have it either way. And it is both ways, isn't it? You see, we need to look more closely at Jesus. What he looks like and what he says. So I'm going to look at several verses that talk about Jesus. He says, I am the I am. Moses said, who shall I say sends me to deliver Israel? And Jesus says, I am that I am. He is the I am, isn't he? But in Revelation, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first letter and the last letter of the alphabet, isn't it? And he also says, I am the first and the last. And the end of Revelation, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. All the way through Revelation, repeatedly, Jesus is the eternal one. Always has been, always will be, 
and he is right now, no matter what happens to us, whether it's fire or flood or divorce or disease or death, Jesus is always with us, leading past, present, future, and we can have confidence in a Jesus like that. But Revelation goes deeper than this. Not only does Revelation focus on Jesus, in particular, it focuses on the cross, repeatedly, the cross, the cross, the cross, throughout Revelation. Let's see it. Behold, he's coming with Kyle. It's talking about the coming of Christ, right? But when he talks about the coming of Christ, behold, he's come with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who what? With the focus, not just on Jesus coming, but Jesus who died on the cross is coming. I am he who is alive and was what? Dead, and behold what? I am alive. Not just focusing on Jesus, but focusing on the cross, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. These things says he who was dead and came to life. Over and over, Revelation focuses not just on Jesus, but on the cross of Jesus. Last week we talked about the throne room. Remember Revelation chapter 4? There was the Father sitting on the throne, an important document in his hand, very important document, so much so that in chapter 5, when nobody was worthy to open it, there was much weeping. Let's read that passage again. In the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood what? A lamb that was slain. Not just focusing on Jesus as worthy, but worthy because of the cross. That is the important part of the life of Jesus. He died so we don't have to die. And then just a few more verses when they're singing praise to Jesus. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were what? Slain. And you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Not just Jesus, but the cross of Jesus. The important thing that Jesus did for us. And then again, verse 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Focusing on the cross of Jesus. In chapter 7 last week, we talked about the 144,000 and the great multitude. They go through a great tribulation. Let's read that passage again. These are the ones who come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white where? The blood of Christ. Not just Jesus saved, but it is the cross of Jesus. His death instead of your death that is the focus. You see, Revelation is less about the churches and more about Jesus caring for the churches. Revelation is less about the war and more about Jesus' guaranteed victory over Satan. Revelation is less about the world and more about Jesus being the best ruler of the universe. Screen is blank because that's all I'm going to say about Revelation 1 now. Pastor wants me to get on and through the rest of the book. So let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. We'll begin talking about the seven churches. The rest of the time we will take only the first church. And then next week we'll take Smyrna and Pergamos. And the next church uh, we will go on and on and on. This time, the rest of this time will be just Ephesus. Ephesus, the seven churches, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These seven churches, a description of seven periods of history. The Ephesus church is the early church. Smyrna is the period of time of persecution. Thyatira, Pergamos is when sin is really become, and we'll go on through seven periods of time. Ephesus is just the first period of time between Pentecost 
and when the last of the apostles died. That's early Christianity. What we will say the rest of this morning is about the Christians of the early period of time. That is the library of Ephesus as it stands today. It's been reconstructed and rebuilt. That library was one of the biggest libraries of the world at that time. Ephesus was not a little city. Ephesus was a big city. Ephesus was the fourth largest city of the world. Ephesus is certainly a good place to write the first letter to the church. Ephesus, the Ephesians church. This is the temple of Diana. It's in Ephesus. Oh, this is just an artist rendition of it, but that's what they see it was. There were 127 columns in and around and throughout that temple. Each column was 197 feet tall. Now, I want you to get the realization of what 197 feet is. Uh, our sanctuary is about 30 feet. So we would have to take metro, on top of metro, on top of metro, on top, on top, on top, six times taller than metro. That was this temple. History says the city of Ephesus was the most superstitious city of the world. Now, most of us know or have the book Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 27 of the Acts of the Apostles is all about Ephesus. I encourage you to go read it. A good chapter. This is just one quotation out of that chapter. Ephesus was not only the most magnificent but the most corrupt of the cities of Asia. Superstition and sensual pleasure held sway over her teeming population. Under the shadow of her temples, criminals of every grade found shelter, and the most degrading vices flourished. Paul preached in Ephesus for three years. And he had a big influence. I want you to notice this text from Acts chapter 19. This is talking about Ephesus, about Paul's success in Ephesus. Many of those who had practiced magic, the superstition and magic and everything that was taught, Paul spoke against it. Many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them and it's totaled, and it totaled how much? 50,000 pieces of silver. I want you to understand what 50,000 pieces of silver is. The piece of silver was a day's wage. 50,000 days wage, that's 137 years salary. Can you imagine bringing 137 years of books to and burning it there, Paul had a very strong influence. Christianity had a very big influence in this city. As I said, the date for Ephesus. There are seven historical periods. This is just the first one from 31 to 100 AD. This was a condition of Ephesus. But it was also the condition of most of Christianity, wherever Christianity was. We're going to read now the letter to Ephesus. This is Christianity as it was early on, before the troubles that came later. So let's begin reading. Revelation 2, 1, that's the beginning of the letter to Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven candlesticks. We need to define. The stars are the angels. 
What did we say angels meant? They are the messengers. They are the messengers. Who's the messenger to, to our church? The pastor. The pastor, the elders, Nick Conan, the teachers that are teaching now around, the angels of the seven churches. Now let's go on and read this again. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks. Now I've been holding this clicker. But this is not the word hold here. This is not this. I'm not talking about the clicker. I'm talking about my holding the clicker. That word hold is the word of the potter who has the clay. And what does he do with that clay? He kneads that clay, softens the clay, and he shapes it with the power of his hand. He shapes that clay until it becomes a beautiful vessel. That is this word hold. These things says Jesus who holds the pastors. God holds our pastor in his hands. That's what this says. God is shaping our pastor with his hands. And God is holding our elders, Nick Connor and the others. God is holding them and shaping them. Why is God holding and shaping the teachers and the elders and the pastors? Why? Because they are responsible for training us, teaching us, helping us to understand God. These things says Jesus who holds the stars in his right hand and walks. But where does Jesus walk? In the midst of how many of the lampstands? It says he is walking not just around Ephesus, not just during early Christianity. Jesus was influential in early Christianity, but he was also influ influential in the church of Pergamum, Smyrna, when there was all the suffering that was going on. Jesus walks among the churches during that period of history, even all the way down to Laodicea, when the church is so corrupt that God is ready to spit him out of his mouth, God is still walking among those churches holding the pastors as best he can to form them. I know your works. We're reading on. I know your works, your labors, your patience. That I know is said to every single one of the seven churches. I know Ephesus. I know Smyrna. I know Pergamos. I know Thyatira. I know Philadelphia and Laodicea. God knows everything. But that word, I know, that comes from the Old Testament too. So let's go to the Old Testament and see what it says about God knowing. 2 Kings 19. God says, I know your dwelling place. You're going out and you're coming in. That was not just true in the Old Testament or the New Testament, or the time of the early Christians. It's true today also, isn't it? God knows you when you leave your house, and God knows you when you come back to your house. God knows. Let's go to another text, Isaiah 46. I am God, and there's none like me, declaring the end from what? From way back here, he tells the end. And from ancient days, he can tell what isn't yet happening. God knows everything, doesn't he? Let's look at the words of Jesus himself. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. I know my sheep, and I'm known by them. Jesus knows. He was in the upper room with the disciples. He knew Judas was there and was going out to betray him. He knew, didn't he? 
Notice what it says. I know he who eats bread with me has lifted his up his heel against me. Jesus knows. And God says that to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and to all the churches. But what does he know? He knows our patience. Paul talks about this. We also glory in tribulation. Well, let's stop right there. Do you glory in your tribulation? <laughs> we have difficulty. I have difficulty, and I'm sure you do too. But God uses tribulation to speak to his people. We're talking about the clouds and how God speaks and leads. He speaks through tribulation. And we should glory in the tribulation, but let's go on. We also glory in tribulation, knowing that tri tribulation produces what? And perseverance, what? And character, what? Hope. But what I want you to see is this word in this word is only one word in Greek. It's the same word. Patience is perseverance. And Ephesus was persevering. Hebrews says, you have need of what? Endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you will receive the promise. Are there promises that we will receive? Absolutely. And we need to know and remember those promises and gain courage. And you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you will receive the promise. But that word endurance in Greek is the same word. You see, endurance is patience. Endurance is perseverance. And the early Christians, from the time of Pentecost to when John died, that period of time, they were patient, they were persevering, they were enduring. I think of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane just before the cross. Jesus said to the disciples, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The flesh, the spirit is willing, but what? Flesh is weak. And what did the disciples do? They slept. Not after, not after the cross and the resurrection, not after Pentecost. They, the early Christians, they had learned about God and God, what he had done for them in the cross. And they were patient. They were persevering. They were enduring. Let's go on. I know your works, your labors. You have labored for my namesake and have not grown weary. Let's go to the Old Testament again. That word weary. Weary. This is talking about King David. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary. That word weary is not just, well, are you weary at the end of the day? Yes, we're weary at the end. But that's not the weary of the Greek. It's weary to the point of exhaustion. And David worked to the point of exhaustion, and his hand stuck to the sword. But the Lord brought forth a great victory that day. Every time I read this text, I remember a newspaper article from early in my ministry back in New England. There was a small commuter airline. No stewards on the plane, just pilot and co-pilot, and they took care of everybody. Uh, they were flying from Portland to Boston, probably, just a short flight. But a notice came on, a light came on in the dashboard, that the door in the back was loose. No stewardesses, so the pilot had to go back and check on that door. And when he got there, the door flew open, and out went the pilot. The co-pilot immediately radioed the tower and said, Notice my position right now. The pilot has just fallen out of the plane. And look for him here. Very quickly, as soon as he could, he flew that plane to the nearest airport. 
And only after they got on the ground did they find the pilot was holding on to a metal bar on the door. Holding on with all that he had. And you know what the article said? It took them 30 minutes to release his hands. 30 minutes to get him to release his hand. You see what this said? His hand stuck to the sword. And when that happened, what did God do? And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. When we labor so hard, there will be great victories. When we as church members labor that hard, there will be great victories. Going on. I know that you cannot bear with those who are evil, and you have tested those say, uh, apostles and have found them liars. While the apostles were living, while they were still living and dying off, even then there were teachers coming into the church, teaching errors. Satan is always working on the church to bring error into the church. But the early Christians, they cannot bear with those who are evil. They have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Now, we're talking about 100 A.D., when John wrote the Revelation. But 50 years later, I mean, excuse me, 50 years earlier, Paul wrote to the Ephesus church. Notice what Paul wrote 50 years earlier. I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Savage wolves. But where are the savage wolves? They are outside the church. The world, the evil influences of the world coming into the church. I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, within the church, also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw the disciples way after them. Two problems, errors coming into the church and errors arising within the church. But in Ephesus, you cannot bear with the evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and found them lying. Do you test me? Do you test our pastor? Do you test our teachers that teach all around? They tested to make sure there was not error coming into the church. I want to give you just one error. There are many. I'll just take one. You know that during this time, emperor worship was demanded, not just re recommended. It was demanded. You had to take incense and say, Caesar is Lord. Now, if you say Caesar is Lord, what does that mean? Jesus. Christians couldn't do that. Jesus is our Lord. We cannot do this. But teachers came into the church early and said, keep worshiping. Keep being faithful to God. Be loyal to God. Love him. Appreciate that he died for us. Don't worry about this. That's just taking a little incense and sprinkling. That's nothing. Forget about it. Worship God. But is that compromise? Just a little compromise. You cannot bear with those who are evil. But you have tested those who say they are apostles, and you have found them liars. Going on. We're coming near the end of the first letter. I have this against you, that you left your first love. Again, we're talking about John writing almost 100 AD, 50 years before that. Notice what Paul said to the Ephesians church. 
He's describing the Ephesians church during the period when the apostles are living. In him you also trusted. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. You heard, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and of your love for all the saints. He is speaking so highly of the church of Ephesus. That was first generation Christians. People who come to Jesus and learn about Jesus and Jesus saves them from their sinful way. They love the Lord and they're happy to talk about the Lord and to share his love. That's first generation. But later, I have this against you. You have left your first love. In the upper room, Jesus washed the disciples' feet and he says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciple, if you have love for one another. Boy, am I really at an hour and 15 minutes? Oh, it's 37. I got another eight minutes. We can go a little longer. Okay. I have this against you, that you have left your first love. The world will learn of the love of Jesus because of us. Now, I read to you a paragraph out of Acts of the Apostles. I want to read more out of that same chapter in Acts of the Apostles. Whoops, I went too far. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, believers rejoiced in the sweetness of communion with saints. They were tender, thoughtful, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they reveal the love that Christ had joined upon them. By unselfish words and deeds, they strove to kindle this love in their heart. That was the experience of the early Christians. But John went on. But gradually, a change came. The believers began to look for defects in others, dwelling upon the mistakes, giving place to unkind criticism. They lost sight of the Savior and his love. They became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies, more particular about the theory than the practice. And in their zeal to condemn others, they overlooked their own errors. And they lost that brotherly love that Christ had enjoined. And saddest of all, they were unconscious of their loss. They did not realize that happiness and joy were going out of their lives and that having shut the love of God out of their heart, they would soon walk in darkness. In one more paragraph. John realized that brotherly love was waning in the church, urged upon the believers the constant need of this love and it goes on. Love, 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 13 times. Emphasizing love. I'm going to show you five pictures. No comments. Just show you five pictures. And after I show you the five pictures, I want you to tell me one thing that is common to all five. Tell me one thing that's common to all five. Number one, two, three, four, five. What's common? Smiles. What else is common? Service. What? Service. Yes. Anybody catch another one? Joy and young people. Young people. Love, service. That's the early Christian church was like that, wasn't it? Now I'm going to show you five more pictures. No comments, just five pictures. When will tell me one common element? What's common? Anger. Anger. Judgmental. Judgmental. Critical. Critical. That's exactly right. I have this against you. You have left your first love. 
which of those five are you? I mean, which of those ten are you? Which of those two groups of five is our church? Because of their criticism, Jesus says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. They have fallen from love, haven't they? And Jesus says, remember. Christians at the beginning, in love with Jesus, they tell everybody. Jesus says, remember that first love. Remember it. But that word remember doesn't just mean, well, yeah, I remember it. And tomorrow, yeah, I remember it. No. That word remember is a durative, continuous activity. I remember, 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 remember. I remember all morning. I remember all noon. I remember all afternoon. I remember the next day all morning. I remember that love that was in the beginning. Remember there from where you were fallen. And then Jesus says, repent. Remember and repent. And the repent brings to my mind the prodigal son. He had everything at home, but he left it all behind and went out and spent all his money, and then nobody gave him anything. And he just fed the pigs. And from there, he remembered home, and he repented, and he went back. or else. Remember, repent, or else I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. That's God's threat to us. We either remember or we lose out. As children, we used to sing this little song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But a later verse says, won't let Satan blow it out. Jesus wants us to remember that love and repent and continue. Otherwise, he's going to remove our lampstand. And I'm ending, ending with this verse. It's the last verse of the chapter, of the verse, of the letter. He who has an ear, let him hear. Listen. Listen. So what the, what the Spirit says to what? Plural. Not only remember what you have heard this week, but that says come next week and remember what is said to Smyrna and Pergamos. And the next week, which says to that letter, listen to what God says to all the churches in love. As God loved. May God help us to be like the early Christians before they fell from that love. Let us pray. Father in heaven, this is your letter to us. Lord, help us to listen to you. When we go home tonight, when we're home this afternoon, help us to listen as God says, study your word of God, be diligent and work hard at what God asks you to do. Be faithful in your day's activity. Lord, please help us. Now, Lord, bless us as we go into the worship service and bless the pastor as he speaks to us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.